Geek Program. It is, wow, January of 2020, big year ahead of us. And with me is Ryan McGinnis. And Ryan, you are uh, kind of my colleague and friend from across the way. You, we are both um, integrators, uh, and we'll get into the details of, of what you do and where you live. Uh, well, maybe not where you live, but let's start off with the most important question of the day. Let's <laughs> dig into uh, your favorite cup of coffee. Do you have a favorite blend, favorite place to go? I do. I have two, actually, because I had to think about this for a little bit. Some days I prefer things a little bit lighter, so I like the Starbucks blonde. And then some days you just I like a darker blend, and I go to Dunkin' Donuts for their dark roast. And I'm just a pure nothing in the coffee. <laughs> wow. All right. <laughs> So full strength, full tech, full strength. Good it's jet fuel. <laughs> so Ryan, let's just start off and it's always best in my estimation to let you kind of introduce your background. So tell us first, uh, you know, your, your background in education, obviously, and then tell us about your job right now. And maybe even, you know, for those seeing outside of the New York region, maybe talk about your BOCES in general and what that is, what that does and your role within uh, the BOCES. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, this is my third year as a professional development coordinator, uh, focusing on technology integration with CA BOCES based out of Olean, New York. And um, I'm also the newly appointed data protection officer. So congratulations me, right? <laughs> Get an extra, an extra job responsibility tacked on. Uh, but I'm a former 10-year uh, classroom teacher, so I spend time teaching fifth grade, second grade, and a STEM lab, and I've always loved technology. So this was just a great way to, you know, progress my career. And in between there, between the classroom and this BOSIS job, I served two years as an elementary principal in Pennsylvania. So I've, I've done the teaching route, I've done the admin route, and I think this is where I like to live the most as a staff specialist, you know, for professional development. So my job, as you well know, is um, I go around and I help teachers who want to learn more about technology, and I try to find a lens that fits for them. So it's not just a one one size fits all approach. You know, we really try to make the tool match what it is that they want to accomplish in the classroom. So sometimes it's on demand. You know, I need triage help right now. You know, help I logged out. Help I need this. And some days it's I get to go in in front of a classroom and bring some robots really get into coding and, and in depth with some fun aspects. And other times I just get to host a PD workshop on you know something relevant and engaging that I really uh, feel passionate about. So it could be technology, uh, AR, VR, it could be even one of my genius hour, like an, an internal thing that I really care about. Um, so I get the chance to really explore things that I'm curious about and I get to present on them. So that's kind of like the role of the BOCES. Uh, Pennsylvania doesn't have a BOCES. This was a shift for me. You know, we have uh, an intermediate unit, and they don't get relied on nearly as much as what a BOCES provides. So um, you've worn a lot of different hats, a lot of different perspectives. Um, as a technology integrator, what are some of your day-to-day, -day, you know, inner workings? What are some of the challenges? What are some of the, the highlights of your role? In tech so what I really like is I'm one day a week at Hinsdale Central School, and then I have about 11 or 12 other districts that I'm in throughout the rest of the month. So I'm always on the road and it's a new place, and a new, a new face every day. And I like that. Uh, it brings a challenge to me. You know, I'm always on my feet trying to find out what it is that I need. But it's also the biggest thing that I sometimes dislike about the job is I never get to see, not never, I hardly ever get to see a project through because I'm one day a week. Sometimes I can start something and I want to, to watch that progression of that classroom teacher finish it off. And um, sometimes we just don't get to see that. So uh, I like being able to, to help and, and get them started and guide them in the right direction. But sometimes I miss being able to see the, the end result and the fruition of that project. Well, and, and talk about kind of your journey a little bit deeper. Um, when we were talking offline, you, were, you had mentioned um, your background as a student. How did that kind of oh. lead and, and blend into <laughs> what you do now? So, so let me tell you, I took the, took the long way to education. So I, I was always a good student, a uh, straight A student. My parents really instilled in me the value of a great education. And I really worked hard at it. Sometimes things came easier than others. So math and science, I was fantastic at uh, ELA, even to this day. You know, I struggle sometimes with, with understanding some concepts. Um, 
but I, I know that's a weakness area of mine. So I've always worked to try to learn to get better at things. Uh, in school, because of my love for science and the devotion that I gave to it, I actually went to uh, pre-med out of college or out of high school. So I went, went to Duquesne University for pre-university for pre-med, thought I was gonna you know, spend the next seven years getting ready for medical school. And after a year, I realized that I didn't have that love um, that in, that heartbeat wasn't the same. And I really wanted to um, get back into education. So that's where I decided I was going to switch and transfer back to the university in my hometown of Clarion. So I went back to Clarion University, finished off my education degree in two and a half years and went, you know, all summer long. I just wanted to get through. And then I took a job right out of college in West Palm Beach. So it was thanks for the diploma and I'm going to see you later. And I loved the fact that I was you know, young, graduated, and at that time, that was when you'd have a thousand applicants for a teacher's job. You know, there's only one one opening, and I could go south, and it was you know they welcomed you with open arms, and they were just ready for for someone to be in the classroom. So that kind of led me led me here. I love technology, uh, being in that classroom, you know, seeing uh, an urban setting in West Palm Beach, coming back home to be closer to family. And figuring out that there's a big change from West Palm Beach, Florida to, you know, little little Clarion, Pennsylvania is a big difference. You know, they don't have the vast resources. They don't have computers in every classroom. Uh, it's just that's where my love has come from to try to, try to equal the playing field, equal the playing field, bring some equality to education uh, through technology. So let's dig into some of those, uh, you know, big technologies. So there's a lot of, um, I guess. There's some technologies that are on the horizon. What are you seeing as technologies that are on the horizon that are interesting to you? Things that you kind of got your um, maybe exploration hat on to dig into deeper. What are what are some of those things? So I really love right now, and it's hard for me to say because I never was a Microsoft guy, but I'm really digging uh, Microsoft Teams right now just the way that it wraps the entire product around the core Microsoft apps. Uh, it just makes the streamlined process for the classroom so much easier for teachers. So I've been really doing a lot of work around getting the uh, paperless aspect of the classroom started with Microsoft Teams. And then I've got my favorites, uh, Flipgrid. I really enjoy digital literacy and digital story storytelling. And I love the fact that students can record quick snippets uh, inside the Flipgrid app. Wakelet, I love the idea of a content curation tool. So I really love Wakelet. Uh, I can't wait to explore that more with teachers this year. And then I've got my other niches that I love. AR Maker, M-A-K-R, it's an iPad only app, but it allows you to take uh, and build in a three-dimensional space and then project it back out on your iPad. So I really love the applications for teaching our kids how to create with AR instead of just consuming AR. So I'm really looking at that next step with that. And then one more, I love co-spaces. So co-space is the same thing, being able to take your virtual reality that we all know students love, but now they're building their own applications for it. So that's where we're kind of spending our time is AR and VR everywhere. But how can we get the kids to now be involved in the content creating instead of just consuming? Yeah, you know, I think that's certainly, I, I think it's interesting because uh, I too was not a Microsoft person right out of the box. Uh, well, let me actually reverse that. I guess I started as a Microsoft person and then thought, you know, oh gosh, Mac is the is the company that's doing all that. And then Google comes along with Chromebooks and really is starting yeah. you know, classroom and doing all this dynamic stuff. But Microsoft really has all of a sudden exploded back on the scene in education and the apps and things that they're using from Teams to even PowerPoint uh, yep. is all of a sudden becoming, you know, we all thought PowerPoint was, was going to fade away, but uh, it's actually back in, uh, I think. It's back with a vengeance. <laughs> it is, and it's so powerful. It's so many things you can do, and they're also making it so it's pretty fluid, whether you're in the online versus the, you know, uh, desktop version of their their applications. Yeah. So I definitely think Microsoft has, has come back uh, with a roar and I in education, yeah. I really like the fact that they're focusing too on the inclusive technologies. Not that that you know it has to be a, a mindset of theirs, but the fact that they're bringing that to the forefront and evening the playing field for all students 
It just, I mean, that's one of their core components right now. And you can see that with the transcription inside of PowerPoint and the coaching inside of PowerPoint. Like that's, there's two ideas that PowerPoint never had and they're floating, you know, immersive reader being turned into an open source platform. Those things really just have changed the game. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they've really actually, I think, become a leader in that, uh, in those features, you know, again, I want to give Apple their, their due credit as well with this, with the accessibility oh, yeah. options they've done in the iPad that they've had for a long time. Yes. Nobody really knew they existed. So, no, um, right? <laughs> but they've always been powerful. So I definitely got to give them their, their props there, but no. let's, um, let's dig back into what you were talking about AR and VR, because I agree with you. Like the creation is the key mm-hmm. piece and it's the challenge, you know, I think as an integrator, as a former teacher, you know, full-time classroom teacher in the trenches, you know, time to learn these things is a challenge, let's face it. And then, yeah. you know, uh, you know, something like Co-Spaces, I think does a really nice job of making the complex simple, Easy. but yeah. it also takes some understanding and it also takes some patience with teacher and it takes some time to develop, uh, you know, a good Co-Spaces activity and lesson and and true you Mm -hmm. could let the kids dig into it on themselves but it does require the teacher to have some some knowledge of the program and and even just to set up a class that sort of thing how do we kind of Mm -hmm. ease that burden um for teachers and and hopefully not only have their their students created which is ultimately where we want it but for teachers to be creators as well I like the fact that we in our region has been able to host a couple of co-spaces workshops and not just co-spaces, but we do AR VR workshops and we showcase pretty much the the entire gamut of here are simple, easy buy-in AR VR concepts. You know, the quick five, five cent apps that you can get that just really you're in, you're out, uh, things like 1600, you hover over the, the dollar bill, you know, and there it is. And then we get a little deeper and we're talking, um, some of the tours and, and things you can take through like Google arts and education they're being able to, to zoom in and see these different applications. And then now we can drum all the way up to the upper level. Uh, so throughout a day, we get to build that scaffold of, we'll give you a little bit of easy stuff. We'll give you some middle stuff, give you some higher stuff. And wherever that comfort level is at the end of the day, I feel that we've really given them some place that hit their comfort level. So we spent some time at summer tech camp going, you know, we've given you an introduction to cold spaces. If you want to come, and get a little bit deeper of a dig, here's the chance to do that now. Sometimes it's us going into the classroom and being able to put my teacher hat back on for a good 45 minutes and say, I'm going to build with you. Your teacher is going to sit as one of you do, and let's build together. And I can put the challenge out in front of them and say, we're going to build you know, a jungle safari. Everybody puts their jungle safari on their screen and give them minor things to do that still lets them have some open spaces, but they're they're able to kind of fulfill a task and then see that no one does it the same, which I think is, you know, it's missing sometimes in education today. There's not a, we got to get create some creative thinkers out there. You know, that's, that's missing somewhere. I don't know. So I really try to get them to do that and get the teachers involved, let the teachers and the students see that there's not a right or wrong way and get them involved just like the students are. So I read an article recently about, you know, 2020, what are some of the trends that are coming down the pike? Of course, AR, yeah. VR, seems like that's been part of the, the trend. <laughs> they keep saying yeah. this is the year for AR, VR. No, right? And again, yeah. if, if you're an AR and VR you know, person, you know, yes, you've already seen it and yeah. latched on to it. But I'm not seeing it full scale yet in schools. And I'm still a little wary of of VR in particular, as much as I see its potential, I think you hit on it earlier that it's not there yet as a creation device. And, and if it's not there as a creation device, there's not a lot of learning goes on. There's, there's viewing, but there's not that, that creating piece. Which yep. develops. Do you think 2020 is the year that VR finally takes off or another one they've talked about as artificial intelligence? You know, what is that and where, where do we go with that? So I actually think artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to be taking off this year. And I feel like VR is still going to hang in the background and just wait. Uh, it's come a long way from the old, you know, uh, viewfinder that we used to have growing up to get to where we are now and being able to explore those places. But the, the content creation for VR just doesn't seem to be there right now. 
and I'm hoping 2020 is the year. But I really think the AI, artificial intelligence, the machine learning, that's where I feel, you know, simplifying tasks and getting things done and bringing in those aspects to the classroom. I've got bigger hopes for that this year because you've got the major players, Google, Apple, Microsoft, they're all uh, gung ho on the machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, they're not really, aside from Apple, you know, Microsoft's not digging into VR yet. You got HoloLens too, but it's, they're pricey. So they're not gonna be affordable for every classroom. Uh, Google's of course got their, their cardboard and they've got their tour creators, but you know, we've, we've talked before, into the school districts and just networks and getting those things to work. So I think VR is going to have to wait a year. So let me just bounce back to my questions here. Where do you go? You know, one of the reasons I, I've always liked uh, chatting with you is you really have just such a depth of knowledge about all things tech. Where do you go for your sources of ideas and inspiration? Are there people that you follow, places that you follow? Um, where does it, where does that come from? Where you get that breadth of uh, ideas and resources? Yeah, so I'm a very avid. I don't call myself a reader, but I guess I I'm an avid reader of short things. So of course you get your popular things like Ed Surge, you get Mashable, you know, quick quick accesses like that. Um, I like to follow The Verge, Nine to Five Mac, and Nine to Five Google as far as websites because I feel even though they're more uh, platform agnostic. I like to see what's coming. If there's new AR app that's out there, uh, I like to be able to stay connected with what's going on and try to go hands on and see what the application is for the classroom. So sometimes it's a day wasted playing with something before I realize it doesn't work. And other times I'm ready to go because I see something happening. But I think the biggest part of it is Twitter. Twitter, I was reluctant to join another social media platform. Uh, I'm not really a, much of a social person, but Twitter really allows me to I don't know, I've kind of come out of my shell on Twitter and able to, it's like on demand for my soul. I can just scroll through and if I'm holding my son, you know, he's drinking a bottle, I can, um, I can find PD and I'm like, oh, I love that. And here's a great idea. I didn't think of this. And I can constantly save things and retweet. And the ideas that I've gotten off of that have been fantastic. And I think just like you've mentioned before, PLN and knowing the right people to connect with. Uh, I've struck up a conversation with Matt Miller on Twitter and we were able to, uh, have him grace us with his presence last year during summer tech, tech camp. And this year we reached out to Trevor McKenzie. So now we're going to focus it all around inquiry and the inquiry mindset. So that's going to rule our summer tech camp this year. So it's just finding things out there. I think Twitter is the best place to go. Yeah, I, I really do. And, and Twitter can get a little crazy when you go outside your education <laughs> circles. It gets, it gets down, uh, yeah. downright, downright mean. <laughs> but uh, if you can stick to your, your tech circles, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, Matt Miller, of course, yeah. is an excellent follow. And Matt's, you know, he, the stuff he does, again, he encourages creation from teachers and really uh, pushes those ideas. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great stuff. And who is the other person you mentioned? Uh, Trevor McKenzie. He's a teacher out of, out of British Columbia. Yeah, he's all about inquiry based and uh, understanding how to put some PBL into practice in place. And it just really fits with uh, getting that technology into, a, into an application for teachers. So, all right. Well, we're now at we're the pretty excited to have it coming this summer. Okay. I want to see it. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go through the toughest part, which is the Speed Geek questions. I'm going to try and bring up. Can you see the Speed Geek questions on your screen? I can. All right, so we'll give this a try and see if uh, we can get this. We'll go through at least three of them. And they're meant to be short answers. You pretty much have talked about this one. So if you were to say to your tech trend to watch for, I'd still say AI, uh, machine learning. But I'm going to throw one more out there. How about esports? Oh. Can esports get any bigger? But I'm going to hit on esports. Where is that going to hit? Yeah, you know that's an interesting one, and I'm still I'm still debating whether that's <laughs> I'm still debating the virtue of esports. <laughs> I'm still not a hundred percent there, but I me either. But I gotta I gotta know. I, I'm watching out for it because I I yeah. don't know what that is. 
Yeah. Well, and again, if it gives but, kids that don't not normally have something to go to school for and to be able to show off, it's certainly some skills and their talents. So um, why not? Right. Yeah. All right. Well, you will give next question. Well, okay. What's your favorite tablet? Uh, I've never had an easier question. I am a big Apple fan. So um, I'm digging my new uh, iPad Pro 12.9. I love it. I love the pencil, the second generation pencil. I love the keyboard. I just love the fact that the apps just work. Um, and that's nothing against anything Google or Microsoft, but I like those. Yeah, it, I, it really I is. love my iPad. <laughs> well, and it's such a stable device. It almost is unfair that they, you know, after a while, the software yeah. doesn't work on it. Because, I mean, I, ha I bet you if I powered up my first generation iPad that I bought, I bet you could still work, you know? But the software so yeah, yeah. Yeah. My yeah, my daughter uses uses our iPad too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What can you say? It works, right? All right. We'll go with the one here. Okay. Works just what's your, fine. What's your favorite way to unplug from technology? Oh, that's a tough one. So when I was an admin, I realized that I was always on demand. So I realized that coming home, I put a basket in the kitchen, and from four to six thirty, my phone gets put into that basket and I don't even think about it. So I have some family time for, you know, two and a half hours of dedicated, you know, I'm, I'm on the ground playing with my kids or I'm outside. Uh, and then after 6.30, usually after dinner time, I can pick my phone back up and, and start catching up on some stuff. But I think we, we forget that we need to unplug sometimes. And even as tech guys um, and just tech people in general, you know, I love technology, but I need that time away. So yeah, the basket of four to 6.30. <laughs> that sounds like a really good idea. Yep, our whole family does it, so. Uh, that's good. Everyone gets buy-in. All right, let's go one more here. Besides students, who or what inspires you? Yeah. We talked about a couple of people already, but. Ooh. Yeah, besides students, who and what inspires me? I think just anybody who's doing something cutting edge and cool, I get jealous and I want to do something cool and exciting too. So <laughs> I'll see things on Twitter and I'm like, I want to do that. That that looks cool. And people who have really, um, I don't know, this might be a, a side tangent here, but I never realized that Keynote on an iPad could do so many things. And it turns out that Keynote is like the secret key to making um, AR work. And all these fun, fancy things they're doing, they're using Keynote as the way to do that. And that's blown my mind. So that has been a huge inspiration for me. Um, I've decided I want to become an Apple Distinguished Educator at some point in time and go through that cohort process. Um, so things like that inspire me. And sometimes it's just the students that when I look around the classroom, it's the ones who are disengaged. And I want to, want to know what, what are we doing that that kid's turned out already? And how do we reach that kid so that they're more engaged? So it's not necessarily a who, it's just that, that kid who we need to reach. Yeah, it's a definitely again a challenge of our age yeah all right let's let's go with one more here and perfect okay this is always a fun one so what's your whimsy Ooh. star wars star trek harry potter what what's that you know is it marvel comics whatever no so can i go i'm gonna go completely different i might go non-geekish but it's probably gonna be a geekish answer does james bond count sure so I, I may own every James Bond movie ever created maybe three or four times. So I might, have it, I might have had it when they released the original sets on DVD. And then, of course, they came out on Blu-ray, right? So I have those. And then they came out with my Apple TV. I just also may have purchased them all on there as well. So I have, I have three, three different versions of every James Bond movie that may have ever been made. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, James Bond counts. <laughs> You're the first person who's answered that one. I figured that might be the first one, so it's it's a different take on it. Yeah, it's funny. I, I won't mention his name because he always gets mad at me for, for, for blabbing this, but I kind of, I'm proud of him. But uh, the one of the tech directors in the schools here locally was one of my fifth grade students, and now he's like a tech director at a school. And I'm like, yeah, I did that. You know, like, <laughs> oh yeah, nothing. Like that, of course, but, but he was a big James Bond guy, you know. And I, I remember that all those years later, you know. But so maybe James We're Bond is there. the secret to, uh, to your higher <laughs> order thinking. 
<laughs> we're out there. It's a niche group, but we're out there. <laughs> awesome. All right, Ryan, well, we are at the top of the hour. Thank you so much for your time. Keep up the great work. I'll be following you on Twitter and uh, let's connect. We'll see each other, I'm sure, around the block here. Nice. Well, thanks for having me. Too. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again.